Live. Facebook Live. From Medina. Not at the hardware store. In our driveway. In our driveway. <laughs> hey, guess what, everybody? We fit the bill and bought the internet. <laughs> <laughs> It's only 2024. Yep. <laughs> Pretty soon we'll get a VCR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, how you doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. Yeah, nice to see you. Nice to see you. You're lovely as always. Well, you look very handsome. Thank you, my love. Anything new? Anything interesting? Oh, no, not too much. Not too much. Yeah. Yep. Well. Happy Sabbath to you, happy Sabbath to Mom, happy Sabbath to Cindy, Ed, Felicia, Emily, Joe Bibles, Don Layton, David Sherwood, Dolores, Victoria, Jay, Clarissa, Little Cutie, a lot of people, the Heacocks, yeah. thank you everybody, Denise, everybody, Ray, uh, Ray Fouché, everybody, thank you all for coming, checking us out, you and your patience, your prayers, Danny, we love y'all, hope y'all are doing well. You ready to pray? I'm ready to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to pray on the Holy Sabbath day. We ask for the extra measure promised in your word of love, truth, and freedom. We ask that you pour your spirit into us as a river and that you would just speak through us, hide us in your hand. And thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us, from food to safe places to sleep, jobs. Thank you for being our loving Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, Keely. Nice to see you. Hello, April Heacock. Happy Sabbath. And so, today... Oh, thank you, Mama. You. Today, we're going to talk about the scapegoat mechanism, which is a satanic principle found from the knowledge of good and evil, which really controls a large portion of the human mind. Uh, so, we're going to go right into it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loves not, knows not God, for God is love. He that agapes not, knows not God, for God is agape. So, for us to know and understand who God is in character, method, and principle, we have to know and understand agape because God is agape. Psalm 18, verse 30 says, God is perfect. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. So this perfect, unchangeable God who is agape is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And for us to know him at the core essence of who he is, we have to know agape. And this fits into part of our uh, core Bible study principles that we use. There's three of them. The first one, of course, is that God is agape. 1 Corinthians 13 is the agape chapter. And when you juice that down, you see three things that really stick out. Is that agape is self-control. Agape considers others more important than it considers itself. And agape isn't personally offended by sin. That's a revelation on the character of God. Our second core Bible study principle is that the life of Jesus is the ultimate and complete revelation of the Father. John 14, 9, Jesus is speaking to Philip, and he says, Have I been so long time with you, Philip, and have you not known? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Our third core Bible study principle is that biblical principle explains the scriptures, and that scripture explains biblical principle. It's like a giant puzzle. Isaiah 28, verse 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And today we're going to talk about the scapegoat mechanism. And this scapegoat mechanism is a satanic principle used by society and individuals either to prevent chaos or to stop a society in the midst of self-destructive chaos. The scapegoat mechanism is where paganism comes from. It's what mythology is based on. And the scapegoat itself is the unfortunate victim of society. Now, the scapegoat can be a group of people, but it can is usually a single individual. The scapegoat is 
isolated by society and it's deprived of all its defenders. The scapegoat is proclaimed by the community as a whole to be their only enemy and the source of all their problems in society. The scapegoat is then hunted down, it's exiled or it's destroyed and once the scapegoat is finally expelled from society, either by exile or death, the community finds itself emptied of all its anger, bitterness, and hostility through a psychological purging. And the reason for this psychological purging is because the community which was in chaos projected all of its problems onto this one single person. This one single person was the entire community's enemy, it was the victim, it was the scapegoat. And because the community got rid of this enemy, the community no longer experiences hatred, resentment, bitterness, anger, hostility towards anybody. Because what they perceived as the source of their problems and their only enemy is now gone. And so a psychological purging of all the tension that the community had is now gone because they believe that the source of their problems and the, enter, and, and the, the enemy which everybody had is gone. Now the scapegoat mechanism itself is a lie. It's based on deception. It's based on hatred. It's murder is involved in it. And this is how Satan casts out Satan. He does it through the scapegoat mechanism. So that's what the scapegoat mechanism is. That's what the scapegoat mechanism does. But why? does the scapegoat mechanism happen in the first place? And the answer is imitation. A contagious imitation, which is extremely dangerous. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, all of us, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Essentially, this is the design law of worship. And what it is, is that humanity itself, even at the earliest stages, is driven by a psychological desire to imitate that which it views as important. Again, the design law of worship. How we were designed to operate is one of the reasons why the scapegoat mechanism happens. It's because through the knowledge of good and evil, the way we're created was perverted in a satanic way, and now by design, we do things which are evil. Micah chapter 4 verse 5 Micah chapter 4 verse 5 says for all people all people will walk everyone in the name of his God and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever now the word God is a title it's not a name it's a title given to that thing which is most important in your life. This is why the belly can be a god. This is why Satan be, can be a god. This is why little stones shaped into things can be God. Because that's the thing that's most important in your life. And the Bible says that everyone walks in the name of their God. And what that means is everyone walks in the character of the thing that they find most important. Everyone imitates the things that they behold. But this isn't just true for the spiritual realities of life. This is absolutely 100% true for mankind physically. Even from the moment that we're born, even within the first few hours of life. And if you look into this, it's very interesting that infants, brand new babies, right out of the womb, 
are able to imitate facial movement like the opening of the mouth or sticking out the tongue within the first few hours of life simply by observing other people doing it. So the way God created us, even from infants developing in the womb, is that infants have a hard wired imprint on the mind that what they see is what they should do. That's an important point, is that humanity is literally born imitating the human culture that they're born into. So why do we, as a society, speak English? Because we imitated people who imitated people who spoke English. Our parents taught us English. Their parents taught them English. And so it's a it's a chain of imitation that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. So literally becoming who you are as an individual all starts by imitating someone else. That's very important. But we don't just imitate language. All of our desires, all of our hatred, all of our rivalries, all of our greed is at its source something that we have imitated from somebody else. We imitate love, kindness, and compassion. If you love me, I love you back. If you are kind to me, I'm kind to you back. If you show me compassion, I'll show you compassion. But we also imitate hatred, anger, and hostility. If you hate me, I hate you. If you're angry with me, I'm angry with you back. If you're hostile to me, I'll be hostile to you right back. So at the core of humanity, we all imitate, we all copy, we all mimic each other. We imitate desire, we imitate rivalry, we imi even imitate violence. And here is how imitation of desire works. And desire does not come from myself. My desire comes from others. And here's the perfect example of that. Imagine we're in a room filled with toys and you put a child in that room and you say to the child, you can play with whatever you want. And the child grabs a toy and he starts playing and he's having fun. And a little while later, another child comes along, they're told to grab a toy and they start playing. And that first child sees the other child having fun with a toy that they didn't pick, with a toy that they overlooked, with a toy that they didn't have the desire to play with at first. And that first child thinks that that toy now looks more fun than the toy that I had originally picked. And I want that toy that they have. We all know the story on how this plays out. The first child never had a strong desire for that toy until the other child had it. And so, all of a sudden, the second child's toy becomes valuable. The second child's toy seems more desirable. So, in essence, the first child's desire was based on what the second child was playing with and what the second child was doing. The desire of imitation is essentially covetousness. What I desire is based on what other people have and what other people are doing. Whatever they have seems to give them the fullness of being. And because I don't have the fullness of being, I want to have what they have. So desire, through imitation, is all based on other people, right? I want to be rich as Bill Gates. I want to be as funny as Dave Chappelle. I want to be attractive like those people on TV. This is the desire of imitation. It says, I want what they have. I want their money. I want their beauty. I want their fame so that I can experience the fullness of being like they're experiencing it. So the desire of imitation 
it doesn't just cause us to want fame, beauty, money. This is where wars come in. Because the same way that a child who never wanted the toy that the second child is playing with until the second child grabbed it and the desire, the value of that unwanted toy grew, this is how wars are produced. This is how violence and hatred, murder, and the scapegoat mechanism take place. What we end up doing is just like we see things that we desire through other people, so we also see how other people can be blamed for my problems. This is what the scapegoat mechanism is. It's me projecting my problems onto other people. This person is the reason why my life is incomplete. This person is the reason why my life is horrible. This reason is the this person is the reason why everything in my life is bad and this person must be stopped. Then my life will be better. So imitation is the first stage in all of human development. It drives our desires, it drives our joys, it drives our fears. It it develops our cultures, it develops our society. Imitation is literally at the core of the human experience because it's part of the design law of worship. 2 Corinthians 3.18 it's just who we are from the moment we're born. And it can get out of control very quickly. But we all, all of us, with open face, beholding as in, in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The only way to develop the character of God is to behold the one true God in the life of Christ, in the revelation of God's agape love. Anything else we behold, we will imitate it. And anything else outside of the life of Christ and God's agape love is a is a it's a it's a deception through the knowledge of good and evil. The last Bible study we talked about the scapegoat Achan, right? We quickly looked at the life of Achan in Joshua seven and we said that this was a scapegoat. And what we saw was some very core elements to the scapegoat mechanism. We saw chaos, we saw conflict, and we saw resolution. The chaos was that Israel's perception in their inability to defeat their enemies that something was wrong in the camp. And what ended up being brought forth was an accusation that there was sin in the camp and the person who brought the sin into the camp is responsible for the chaos. We saw that there was a conflict and the conflict was that the children of Israel needed to find and expel this person who brought in the curse. They did this through murder. They stoned Achan. right? And the resolution is that now that Achan, the sinner, who was a scapegoat, is now that he's gone, we can have blessings again. This is absolutely the scapegoat mechanism, and it's all based on a lie, and it's all based on imitation. The scapegoat mechanism is the process by which a group of people in chaos subconsciously imitate each other, and their anger, their hostility, their rage is transferred onto a single victim someone who the someone whom the group sees as a common enemy the group believes that this person is the source of all their problems and the group believes that this scapegoat this enemy this victim needs to be banished or or murdered and they release all of their built-up anger, hostility, and rage into this victim through a psychological projection and through the death or banishment of the scapegoat, their minds are purged from all the anger, hostility, and rage that they had because they believe that their common enemy is gone. This is what happened with Aiken. 
This is what happened with every single scapegoat throughout history. Now, here's the problem with scapegoating. Scapegoating is a lie. It's a deception. It's satanic. It's an illusion. It's a psychological projection that thinks it has peace and unity, but scapegoating doesn't heal the mind. It doesn't heal bitterness. It doesn't cure anger. It doesn't truly release frustration. It doesn't fix rivalries. It doesn't cure greed. And it doesn't fix the hatred of mankind's heart. The group only thinks that peace has come because they believe that their all their problems came from this common enemy and because this common enemy is gone they believe that their problems are gone and it's all based on a satanic lie now what happened with Achan was a lie and I, am I saying that the Bible is wrong in the way it tells the story it's not a lie that the children of Israel were losing in battle. You, listen to the words that I'm saying. It's not a lie that the children of Israel were losing in battle. They were losing in battle. It's not a lie that Achan had taken things that he shouldn't have. Achan should not have taken those things. It's a lie in the extent of the blame which was put upon Achan. Achan was not guilty for all the problems of the society of Israel at that time. Matthew chapter 5, 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 says this, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The truth is, is that Achan didn't have the power to stop God's blessings. He didn't have the power to stop God's blessings. Achan didn't have the power to cause Israel to lose in battle. And Achan's death didn't have the power to end what Israel perceived as a lack of blessings. Everything in this story are exaggerated projections put on to Achan by the crowd and their lies. Were, was Israel losing a battle? Yes. Did Achan take those things? Yes. But it's an exaggerated lie to say that Achan was responsible for all of the things going wrong in the children of Israel's lives at that time. Now, the scapegoat mechanism has very important stages to it. And at each stage, different things take place. You have stage one, which is called contagion. If specific things happen during this stage, then the next stage is more powerful. So you have contagion, scapegoat, deification, and institutionalism. Now this is important because this is where mythology is created. This is where pagan religions are created. Because it's in this process of contagion, scapegoating, deification, institutionalism is governed all pre-Christian in a lot of modern Christ, uh, world society today. So contagion is that imitation stage when society descends into chaos and is on the verge of collapse. Where everyone, it's a war against all versus all and they're looking for a psychological release. The second stage is scapegoating. This is when society blames a single victim for all of its problems and then banishes the victim. Sometimes that banishment is death. And this purges society's mind, deceiving them into thinking since their common enemy is gone, so is their problems. Now, if these first two stages 
are strong enough, a third stage takes place. If the chaos is big enough, if the conflict is strong enough, and if the resolution of peace, if the psychological purging is powerful enough, which brings peace and unity, a third step happens. And that's deification, where the victim or the scapegoat is uplifted and turned into a god. This is where paganism, this is where mythology is born. And after that, the fourth stage, which is institutionalism. This is where the myths are created around the victim. This is where religions are created around the victim. This is where governments and rituals are formed around the victim, which is turned God. And so again, scapegoating is the source of both mythology and paganism. And the reason is because the chaos, the imitation, and the scapegoating mechanism, which specific amounts of blessings of peace. Okay. Go. Okay. 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 So scapegoating is the source of both mythology and paganism. Now, certain elements of this are strong. Well, let's just say a prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we know that you love us and we know that you're with us and we don't have nothing to worry about. So we just ask for your hedge of protection to be around us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I don't look at the comments until later. There obviously is many, many of reality, which is the scapegoat mechanism. It's hard to uh, touch every single facet of every single thing when you're doing Bible studies. We want to get to the point of the scapegoat mechanism. And again, if the K is strong enough psychological projection, the people will believe it had a divine origin. The scapegoat is divine as well. And so what ends up happening is that people become gods and rituals are created to simulate what happened around the scapegoat. And these rituals are designed to copy, to imitate what the people believed brought their peace. And religions are created to worship these new gods. This is how all of ancient society was formed. It's through the satanic principle of the scapegoat mechanism. It's Satan casting out Satan. It's Satan bringing society to a point where they're about to kill each other. And then to restore and consolidate his power, he brings forth a scapegoat. And if it's if the psychological purging is strong enough, new God, one of these, there was a God named Purusha. We're not gonna get into all that. We're just saying creation the way it is today, right? And he's also responsible for formulating society, specifically the caste or slave system. This is what India, the country India, is based on. The country Rome, we all know Rome, they have scapegoat mechanisms as their foundation. Twin brothers, Romulus and Remus. Romulus killed Remus, and right where Remus died, that specific hill, that becomes the sacred ground for the city of Rome. That is history. You can go look it up. Rome again. Julius Caesar is scapegoated by the Roman Senate. And what ends up happening when Augustus runs an empire? It's, it's contagion, scapegoat, deification, institutionalism, all playing out in different parts of the world, in different parts of time, having the same result. I believe that Nimrod, I don't have proof, but I believe that Nimrod was scapegoated and that whole Babylonian system was the scapegoat mechanism. Many, many things in history find their origin in the scapegoat mechanism. Jesus himself, 
He was scapegoated. Let's see. Luke 22:53. Luke 22:53. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is when Jesus was betrayed with a kiss. And he's talking to the people which are about to bring him forth through judgment and to the cross. And what does he say? He says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is proof that the cross has nothing to do with the Heavenly Father, but the cross is the power of Satan because it's the power of darkness, and it's the scapegoat mechanism. So the cross and the scapegoat mechanism are exactly the same thing according to Jesus, and it's this moment in history, the cross, the, the hour and power of darkness, where Satan is trying to restore and consolidate his power over humanity because Jesus introduces the kingdom of God to earth and he becomes the revelation of God and Satan doesn't want the kingdom of God here he doesn't want the revelation of God here so he goes and has the people scapegoat Jesus so that he can con restore and consolidate his power and so for the scapegoat mechanism and so for the cross to be the scapegoat mechanism we need crisis we need chaos we need conflict we need murder and resolution and this is exactly what you see in the gospels matthew 21 33 matthew 21 33 Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and built a tower and let it out to a husbandman, to farmers, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive of its fruits. And the, the farmer took his servants, beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the farmer saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Then they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. And the Lord, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, what will he do unto the farmers. Now, this is the scapegoat mechanism playing out over the course of time, right? There is a crisis, there is chaos. When God sends messengers to the farmers saying, God wants the fruit of your character. And that causes chaos amongst the farmers. The farmers don't want to give God their character. Right? And then there's a conflict, rejecting, stoning, and killing God's messengers, even God's own son. That's, that's the scapegoat process. Conflict, chaos, murder. And we see this exactly happen to Jesus. Jesus predicts it's going to happen to him. John eleven forty eight. John 11:48. Let's go back one. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, "What do we do? For this man does many miracles. We begin to see a crisis. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation." And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them. You know nothing at all, nor consider that what is expedient for us, that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. 
And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. This is literally the scapegoat mechanism, right? We see the crisis, right? If we leave him alone, all men will believe on him. The Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. And the Pharisees, specifically the high priest, uses the power of Satan because murder is the power of Satan. He uses the scapegoat mechanism to get rid of Jesus. Because first, they're afraid of losing their position. They're more worried about themselves than the nation because first it's their position, then it's the nation. And so they make a plan to enact the scapegoat mechanism. Matthew 27, 24. And when Pilate saw, he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult, a riot was made. He took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Now this is after he had offered Barabbas, right? Pilate sees the bloodlust in the group, and he says, I'll give you Barabbas. And the people are not satisfied with the blood of Barabbas. They'll only be satisfied with the what they perceive as the common enemy. And the whole crowd is this way because it's contagious imitation. If the whole crowd says that Jesus is guilty, on a subconscious level, humanity will join the crowd. This is why the disciples left. This is why Peter rejected Jesus. Because of the subconscious imitation that humanity goes through. So the Pharisees used the scapegoat mechanism because they viewed it as a divine work, just like the pagans, right? Kill one to save everybody else. Pilate uses the scapegoat mechanism because he knows that the people will only be satisfied with the shedding of blood. They didn't want anybody else's blood. They only wanted Jesus' blood. These are different aspects of the scapegoat mechanism. One is a perverted view of divinity. One is an understanding of what the crowd needs to bring peace and unity. That's very important. Matthew 23, 35. Matthew 23, 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel until the blood of Ze Zacharias, son of Barachus, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Now, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, but he's not just speaking to the Jews. Jesus is speaking to all of humanity. When Abel was scapegoated by Cain, the Jews did not exist. Very important. All humanity is responsible for the death of all scapegoats, from Abel to Zacharias, everyone in between, and everyone after. Because we're all responsible for the death of these people because we all imitate each other in evil ways. We all play our part in the contagion of blaming others, saying that they're the source of our problems, and all of that builds up to the point where the scapegoat mechanism is enacted. John 16:32. John 16:32. Let me see. Would you look up the verse where he says you have... Let me read it. 
John 16, 32. Behold, the hour comes, yes, is now come, that ye should be scattered, every one to his own house, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because my Father is with me. So Jesus predicts how all the disciples will leave him. This isn't sins that they're solely responsible for. It's the subconscious character of all humanity because we imitate each other. Rejecting Jesus is contagious. It's very important. We see this in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 69. Again, we're talking about one sliver. The scapegoat mechanism. There's lots to talk about. Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, That were there. This fellow was also with Jesus. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrays thee. Then, be, then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crowed. So again, the disciples are not running and rejecting Jesus. They had brotherly love for Jesus. They are not doing something where they're only responsible for the sin. And no other humans have ever done this. This is... This, this is how imitation can be perverted in the human mind. It's a subconscious thing. No human has the power within themselves to reject how contagious imitation can be, especially when the crowd is turning on you. This is all part of the psychology of the mind, the knowledge of good and evil, all playing out in the disciples' lives, in Peter's lives, which causes them to reject Jesus. And we're all guilty of it. If we reject the character, the method, and the principles of God's agape love, we're all guilty of it. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall do them, and keep my judgments. The new heart that we need, that is capable of not rejecting the truth about God, only comes from God. Philippians 2 verse 13, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is a work of God. We are not capable of overcoming the deep-rooted subconscious perversion that Satan has twisted in the minds of humanity, which comes from the knowledge of good and evil. When Jesus was scapegoated and put on the cross, one thing was obviously clear, and it was even declared that Jesus is innocent. That's very important. Even though the crowd blamed Jesus for sins he did not commit, Jesus was declared innocent. This is a revelation for every single person who has been scapegoated. Humanity is the source of the murders in the scapegoat mechanism, not divinity. Humanity is the problem. Violence in us, the hatred, the anger, the bitterness inside of us is the source of the problem. And then we kill people in God's name, proclaiming that it was the law of God, it was what God wanted, and we were simply tools in God's hand killing people. Jesus at the cross allowed himself to be scapegoated so that he could show humanity that we are killing innocent people. The story of Achan shows us sometimes we kill guilty people, but the amount of blame we put on them is completely exaggerated and 
what we're doing is a lie. It's deception. It's always humanity which tortures and kills. It's not God. It's humanity that wants scapegoats, not God. It's humanity that justifies violence and then does it in God's name. It's not God. It's humanity's fear, greed, anger, hostility, bitterness. It's the, the contagious imitation that causes us to gather in groups, scapegoat, and kill people. It's not God. On the cross, Jesus revealed what the scapegoat mechanism really is. It's the hour and power of darkness. Even when you kill somebody who sinned, like Achan, it's still the hour and power of darkness because it's the character, the method, and the principles of Satan. He only deceived us into thinking that it was the character, the method, and the principles of God. The scapegoat mechanism is a very powerful tool that Satan uses over humanity to maintain order. Right? It's the order that Satan wants by the chaos that Satan creates. But the effectiveness and the power of the scapegoat mechanism is completely reliant upon a group being ignorant of what it is, what's happening, and how it happens. Matthew chapter 7 verse 3. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote, the sliver that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly that the mote of thy brother's eye, that you will cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. When we stop focusing on the problems of others, right? I can't fix people, right? I have bigger problems in my life than those people have in theirs. It's not my responsibility to go and try to fix every single person. I need to go to God and work with God so that I can be fixed. All those problems that other people have, those are relatively small compared to the problems that I have. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the person that you're trying to help has a small problem. You have a big problem. Right? If we stop focusing on the problems of others, blaming others, the scapegoat mechanism can't exist. It cannot exist. But it does exist. Even today, in homes and families and churches, in governments, it exists because we're ignorant on the character, the method, and the principles of Satan. It exists at home because from the core essence of who we are as little babies, we imitate those in our lives and they teach us bad things to imitate. It exists because churches and governments tell us that there's a bad guy out there. I do not feel guilty saying this. Churches and governments tell us that there's a bad guy out there and you don't want to be like them. You don't want to be like the Jesuits. You don't want to be like the Muslims. You don't want to be like the atheists. You don't want to be like the homosexuals. You want to be like us. And so what happens? We end up imitating the things that we're taught, and we end up having hatred for the Jesuits. Who Jesus died for? Oh, man, Mr. Brad, you're crazy. The Muslims, the atheists, all these people... We scapegoat and say that they're the source of the world's problems, and maybe they are guilty. But same thing as Aiken. We can exaggerate 
the blame that we put on people and we can try to pick out all their flaws when we need to face the reality that we have a beam in our own eye. True peace will never come by going around finding all the flaws that everybody else has. Jesus showed us what true peace is. When you're scapegoated, have self-control. Consider others more important than you consider yourselves. And not being personally offended by sin. And forgiving others for what they have done to you because they don't know what they're doing. People, it's a satanic, psychological, false peace. Churches, governments, families, they're guilty of it. True peace only comes about by imitating Jesus, but specifically Jesus. The point that I wanted to make is that as the character, method, and principles of God's agape love is replicated in his people, so the character, method, and principles of the knowledge of good and evil will be replicated in Satan's people. They'll both culminate at the same time and there'll be a revelation. There'll be an apocalypse and the two will come head to head. And as God's people are scapegoated for all the problems in the world, Satan's system will finally come to an end. That's what we're waiting for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for providing for us a Bible study, the internet, and for helping us get through the whole thing. We thank you for your agape love, for protecting us, for providing for us, and for giving us all the nourishment, physically, spiritually, emotionally, that we need as your children. As the Sabbath day is still with us, help us to remember the beauty and excellency of your agape love as you infused it into creation and revealed it in redemption. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time. God bless you.